The 3rd of January, 1892, Chetworth House, Cornwall. Archie, our next adventure soon arrives. You may be glad to know that we return to the frozen landscape, a land devoid of any hostile human encounter. Rest assured, we hope to avoid the traumas of our previous adventure. On this occasion, we travel to the base of the world, to the Antarctic, in pursuit of that great leviathan of the sea. However, we seek not to slaughter this magnificent beast, as reported by Melville in the year of my birth. Instead, we plan to deliver a school of those engaged in cetaceous research from the Royal Society to the edge of the Antarctic ice to study the habits of those whale species that inhabit the frozen south. We hope to detect suitable specimens in the open sea and follow the whale at some discreet distance, as that great detective of the Strand magazine might trail an alert suspect to determine his habits. I was approached by the Royal Society in the usual manner and was introduced to those portly individuals within the cytology research community who have risen to such a position of authority that they govern the expenditure of funds and resources in their quest for knowledge. Naturally, I invited these gentlemen to a private club in the London city of which I am a member to sample the fine spirits and fortified wines retained by the institution for just such an occasion. I was well prepared for this encounter, and in particular was well aware that these worthies of the whale-watching world have often come into dispute at public conferences, and within the pages of those scientific papers that such gents are wont to pass as currency between themselves. Once settled into the finest port, it took but little time for these two gents to foray back to the bosom of their disagreement and set to. The topic upon which they settled— and about which had no doubt met on numerous occasions, roused their spirits into a debate to such an extent that club stewards had on more than a single instance the occasion to intervene and keep order, lest the raised voice of science itself disturb other members in the lounge. I was quite bemused by this dispute and found little that might sway me one way or the other. The question to be resolved concerns the minka whale, a small example of the baleen type that is most agile and can swim with considerable speed. We concern ourselves with their feeding habits, and in particular whether they feed beneath the ice of the southern oceans. Suffice it to say, it seems that some in the whaling world consider the minka much like other cetaceous species, who lunge into the depths to find their meal. Others who engage in such research suspect that these creatures dart with speed just below the ice that covers the southern waters, gulping huge mouthfuls of marine creatures to be found near this frozen boundary as they travel. Once the evening had worn to such time that our waiter began to make polite suggestion that we avail ourselves of a carriage or of the private rooms to be found in the club, my guests were two sheets to the very wind that I hope will carry us southward. The hour became late, and yet strongly they still swam, fortified in academic redoubt, built from the logic of their respective positions. Of course, if they had come to some agreement, it seemed likely that our motivation to travel to southern climates might dissipate, as might their enmity, and with it the necessary funds to finance our next adventure. Knowing something of Wales from my many years of marine adventure, it was not difficult to bolster the defence of one side, should a particularly good argument convince the other, and threaten an unsatisfactory armistice. With the club stewards breathing down my collar and time running short, the necessary funds required to resolve this dispute were promised and papers signed. So, we are off to the Southern Pole in search of Wales. As a consequence, despite the scientific frame about this quest, we venture to the frozen southern pole to settle a wager between two venerable fellows who wield some considerable influence in that world of cetaceous research. The problem before us is simple. How might we detect this small species of whale, pursue it to its feeding grounds at a healthy distance to avoid disturbing its natural course, and follow it beneath the ice? Uriah. The 12th of January, 1892. Archibald Jenkins, Bristol. Uriah, I assure you that I am quite recovered from our jungle trials. 
For certain, one may on occasion revisit these dark dangers in that isolated narrative to be encountered each night. However, perhaps this fantasy is mere debate with one's own self, and as I am sure to come to some agreement, such visions will hopefully fade with time. As we turn to our new horizon, again we turn to prior art for solutions, before we embark upon the task of problem-solving. It occurs that your request is surely a solved problem. After all, the whaling fleets of the world have hunted these leviathan for centuries. A stroll to the Bristol docks might easily discover those who would teach me well how to find and how to pursue whales of every species. However, I suspect the objectives of your cytologists may incorporate goals little considered by those marine hunters. We wish to pursue the whale, but do not wish to startle him from his usual habits. We wish to follow his trail, without warning that you walk his path, or indeed swim in his waters at all. Indeed, to pursue a whale beneath the ice of the Antarctic is a trail that no whaler ever considered to follow. Furthermore, I thought it best that I inform myself of the habits of our quarry, and have spent some time in academic pursuit of our prey. It seems that we wish to stalk a species of whale that is not only particularly small, but also unusually fast through the water, and also sufficiently supple to present a rather agile target. Should we startle this beast, our vessel must offer over 24 miles per hour to keep pace, which your maritime skills may indeed coax from sail and steam. However, in the effort to make rapid headway, we may make such a tremendous noise that our quarry will only be motivated to further flight. The minka whale is also not disposed to remain at the surface for long periods, but to our advantage, must make his presence known every twenty minutes or so to take a breath. Hence, our means to track this creature is laid bare. We cannot follow this creature as we might a whaleboat towed by a fixed line driven into the beast's flesh. We must suffice with periodic sightings made at intervals of up to twenty minutes. In this time at full flight, a minka whale might make headway eight miles hidden from our view, to take a moment's breath, and sink once more beneath the waves. From a mast top one hundred feet from the ocean surface, we see only twelve miles before the horizon obscures our objective. A minky whale beside our vessel, and startled to its maximum speed, must only surface, but once or twice to take a breath before the earth's limb conceals him from our view forever. Finally, at only twenty-six feet in length, such a speck, may be impossible to discern against the vast void of grey sea. Our pursuit must therefore resolve numerous contradictions. We must pursue at speed, and yet remain silent. We must observe a large area, and yet must locate a small object within that huge expanse of ocean. We must scrutinise every small patch of ocean in detail to find a small object, and yet must also survey every inch of a huge expanse in detail. I propose that these contradictions may be resolved if we achieve two ends. First, we must never startle the creatures into flight, and hence need never resort to steam to build up speed. Second, we must devise some mechanism that makes our target much easier to detect at a great distance. Observe that each solution serves the other. The less likely we provoke the creature to flight, the closer we draw him to our observation. The greater distance from which we can observe the target, the less likely we will provoke it to flight. So I ask you, how might we observe a whale from a great distance? How might we make this whale more easily observed? Archie The 21st of January, 1892, Chetworth House, Cornwall. Archie, your questions are surely problems that are in possession of solutions. At sea, the clear solution to observation at great distance is offered by a vantage point lifted well above the surface of the ocean and a spyglass that will magnify any object captured within its scope. Of course, as ever, we offer a solution to one problem, and we invariably introduce a harm to another part of our device. For every solution that I haul ashore with my line, upon my hook I will invariably find attached yet another problem. The more solutions I pull from the brine, the more problems I dredge from the depths. The only resolution to this endless chain is to maintain this pull until we reach the end of our line to hope that our last catch will be a solution, not the loose end of yet another problem. To ensure that our quarry remains least disturbed by our presence, how might we double the distance that we can observe from 12 to 24 miles before the horizon makes its presence felt? This would demand a crow's nest so far above our deck that our main mast might measure 400 feet. Imagine such a lofty perch, spyglass in hand. 
The smallest swell would swing our vantage atop this arm to such an extent that I see no means to keep our target within the small aperture of a spyglass, nor a means to settle the strongest stomach of a well-weathered seafarer. Our mast must therefore be no mast, and be not affixed to our deck, and yet we must remain aloft. To resolve this contradiction, we must adopt some means of lifting power alternative to the support of a mast, and a balloon seems an obvious solution. A hydrogen balloon could lift our observation point to a tremendous height, whilst not affixed in any significant manner to our deck, save a strong rope to prevent our lookout from ascending to the heavens, never to be seen again. And yet, I once more return to our objectives, and once more discover that I have introduced a new contradiction into our conundrum, and to pull upon that fishing line we are once more provoked. I have, in my mind's eye, lofted a great balloon above my ship to offer a mast of great altitude, but note that we desire great speed, should we find the need to pursue the mink at its greatest pace. And yet my ship is now encumbered by a great bladder suspended in the heavens to retard our motion, as might a great anchor plunged into the depths. Once more I make my analysis, knowing well the function that I seek, to suspend our observation platform aloft with a means to achieve this end, which is only to our advantage and never to our cost. As you have long taught, we look to the environment for our solution, for the elevation of our function to the wider environment will often yield an elegant result. And there, suspended in my mind, I find a great kite, much like those I flew as a boy above the green fields of the family estate. With such a mechanism, our observation platform is not only lifted to its proper height above the ocean using the power of the wind, but it may also act to propel our vessel to the speeds we may require to pursue our prey. This great spinnaker may haul our vessel into pursuit without recourse to steam, and hence in complete silence. A great kite may satisfy all of our demands. A stable observation platform lifted to a great height. A burst of speed in complete silence. We must now determine how we can not only survey the great area of sea that spreads below, but also scrutinize this marine landscape entire in great detail. Uriah. The 2nd of February, 1892. Archibald Jenkins. Bristol. Uriah. Appended to the enclosed papers I represent the lifting mechanisms that you propose, and I agree that an enormous propulsive kite may indeed not only offer the observation platform that we desire, but also the muted propulsion we require to discourage our prey to take flight. Upon this lofted platform, we can incorporate an observatory replete with telescopic equipment with which to scrutinize the oceans below. And yet, if we observe from a greater height aloft, we will discover a greater expanse of ocean that we must survey, which is both blessing and a curse. The greater expanse we can observe, the more time is required to survey this ocean entire, and also the smaller our target will appear. We once more introduce a benefit that is accompanied by harm. The ocean that we must survey, and the object that we seek, differ greatly in their respective scales. If our method of observation rests upon periodic sightings of a marine mammal, when it must surface to take a breath, it would be the greatest frustration to find a suitable specimen only to lose it once more amongst the grey expanse. In preference, once found, we would desire our objective to remain found throughout its journey southward to the ice. To unfold a large expanse of ocean beneath for us to survey is to our benefit, so how might we enlarge our quarry to ensure that it will be quickly rediscovered? I had occasion to visit my parents, who reside only a short stroll across the town, and put this problem to my mother, an ingenious woman whom you well know is adept at thinking in a lateral manner. She considered the problem for but a moment, and almost immediately named yourself expert in these matters. My mother noted that you would not founder against submerged rocks, despite noting that they exhibit the very same property of our prey. After all, a rock sufficient to puncture the hull of your vessel will be very small in comparison to the vast ocean upon which you travel. Yet you never found her in such a manner. With a wry smile upon her face, my mother volunteered no additional clues to her idea and left for the shop floor of the family carriage works. Throughout my whole life, my mother has cultivated my deductive skills by taking her leave with these half-answers and riddles left in her wake to vex. As is her habit, on this occasion she once more left her poor son to discover her proposal without further assistance. 
For the entire stroll back to my residence I was vexed to determine the means by which you detect such rocks to avoid foundering, and almost put pen to paper to inquire with yourself, until I realized my simple error. I had fixed my mind upon the scene in which we expect to search for whale with such inertia, that my mother's proposal was never present in the scene at all. You would avoid those rocks found near landfall, by avoiding the land itself. So the larger hazard warns you of the smaller. However, this precaution you can only take during the day, in the very conditions that we might search for whales. My mother's design is as simple as it is obvious, but requires the veil of night fallen to offer the greatest value. As night falls, and the land can no longer warn of smaller dangers, a lighthouse will warn of impending submerged rocks. Might a similar illumination allow us to track our whale once discovered? Might the blackness of night offer not disadvantage, but benefit, and be required to permit a sight? To pull upon the chain of problem and solution and back to problem once more, we have a new objective. How might we firmly attach a lighthouse to our quarry, and how might such a mechanism be provided sufficient power to light our way for days, or even weeks of pursuit? Of this, you know the solution full well, for as I exchange day for night, to resolve this problem, you must exchange the depths of the sea for the depths of the very land itself. Archie. The 12th of February, 1892, Chetworth House, Cornwall. Archie, your puzzle was by far the easiest to resolve, for I well remember how we illuminated our way during our subterranean adventure of 1888. We solved this problem with a light that draws vitality from our own exertions, and if it were not for this endless illumination that we wound into these lamps once we had lost our way under the earth, we may never have emerged to the surface again. Thank heavens for your singular ingenuity, for we wound the springs of our clockwork mechanics that powered our lamps as if our very lives depended upon it, for they did indeed. You propose that we might use similar to attach a powerful beacon to our quarry, which will quickly alert us should it surface. In dull, overcast, and particularly in nighttime conditions, the location of our target, despite embedded within a vast ocean, will be entirely obvious to our observer aloft. Hence, we have enlarged our prey as we have enlarged the vast sea that we survey. I suspect that our cetological passengers may demand a chase of some days, at a discreet distance, to determine the typical habits of the minka whale. I doubt that the springs that we wind to store vitality within our lamps will store sufficient energy to light these lamps for the entirety of this hunt. As a result, as ever we raise our function to the environment and must oblige our prey to wind the clockwork mechanism of these lamps. The means by which these marine mammals without arm nor hand nor finger nor thumb might wind such mechanism is clear. As the whale swims through the brine, a great rush of water will pass the flanks of this creature. This torrent of water could be put to good use through the addition of a water turbine that passes its power into the body of our clockwork lamp. We propose a lighthouse atop the island of our whale to warn us of its presence. I accept that we must first find this quarry in the traditional manner, and that the application of this lamp may ensure that we do not lose our target once found. However, how will we affix one to the other? We must carefully approach these small specimens and somehow fix our lighthouse in miniature to this whale. I am absolutely opposed to lancing our objective with barbed harpoon, to which we tie a rope, at the other end of which we fast our illumination. Furthermore, any injury to our prey will most likely alter its natural behavior, and may indeed curtail its journey to the southern ice sheet, or its ongoing journey through life at all, for that matter. Hence, I set my mind to determine how we might approach each whale with stealth and harness our lamp to its body without harm. Rather than strike a barb into the objective, we would surely prefer to lasso the whale as those cattle herders of the American prairie capture a stray calf. To pursue a solution to this conundrum, as I might pursue any game, I include my reasoning on the attached papers. It occurs that the security of a sharpened barb, but also the safety of a harness, might be achieved through the application of suction. At the very moment of inspiration, I called for my gunsmith to immediately attend. 
We worked through the night to design the weapon described upon the enclosed papers. A firearm of standard construction projects a suction cup onto the smooth surface of the whale. Although the impact might force sufficient air from under the device to hold fast for some minutes, together we determined that some means to continuously recharge this vacuum is required. Hence, the agitation upon a lever above the device should suffice to work a small pump to maintain this condition. Thus armed, and with the means to approach the beast, we will have the means to attach lamp to whale. Uriah. The 23rd of February, 1892. Archibald Jenkins. Bristol. Uriah. I am intrigued by your modification of the venerable harpoon, for I too have wondered how we might secure our illuminated device to a whale. I had imagined a lighthouse tower entire, perched atop the whale to poke above the surface of the sea. With such a theatrical prop fixed to the grey mound of whale flesh, to distract the eye and disguise this living mass, how sailors may have marvelled at the small moving island propelled past their bows at speeds greater than their own vessels. This scene entire seemed ludicrous, and so I was in search of an alternative mechanism. You draw upon your knowledge of whaling, and choose to trail the illuminated device behind, as a whaleboat is dragged by fleeing prey, a harpoon fixed into its back to trail a frothing red. To this end, I enclose an illustration of the whale-powered lighthouse, which we must fix to our prey. The light source trails far behind the beast fixed by a long chain or rope. The motion of the beast will force seawater through a turbine, which upon turning with sufficient speed will energize an electrical dynamo. The supplementary winding of internal springs, as our hand-wound examples contained, will maintain the supply of energy should the creature remain stationary for a period. The energy supplied will illuminate powerful electrical lights, which once more draws us to a contradiction. We wish to pursue our prey, but do not wish to startle our prey to further flight. To this end, we have carefully affixed a beacon to its flank without injury nor pain. Hopefully, the additional drag from this device will encumber nor concern such a powerful creature, but our prey now trails a powerful bright light. Should the beast attempt to escape this spectre, wherever it flees the light will follow. Any speed at which the whale makes its escape, this phantom will match precisely. How can we see this beacon from many miles, the brilliance of which the beast will remain entirely ignorant? This contradiction is easily resolved by noting that we reside aloft in the air, whilst the beast will ever remain below. A rolling mass may ensure that only the uppermost lamp remains lit, whilst those lamps directed into the dark waters will be automatically disconnected. Hopefully, with the lamp trailing far behind and directed only into the skies, the whale will not be startled by this powerful illumination and provoked to even greater flight. With such a device affixed to our prey, we shall detect and pursue him through both day and night. This mechanism only describes the central act of our story. A trouble remains. How might we first find our prey, launch boats, skulk towards agile, alert and energetic creatures, make fast our illuminating lamps, and recover our boats before the creatures detect our presence and take flight? I would prefer that an idea occurred to me from careful observation, much as Newton found, and an apple fell upon my head to propel me to an innovation. However, no such poetry provoked me to look skywards, for the idea simply appeared in my mind, unbidden. It occurred that in our design, we have already launched a boat of sorts, for aloft, we imagine a great kite hanging above our vessel. With a suitable method of control, and a suitably long line to fix it to our ship, could we swoop down from the heavens in silence? To this end, I propose an open platform be slung beneath our observation post, aloft. From this perch perhaps we do not resort to ingenious invention, but merely to the sharp eye and steady hand of human skill. I have witnessed on many occasions the great Chetworth perform feats of skill with firearms from the most unstable of footing. From the swaying back of great elephants to the pitching, rolling deck of a ship at sea. Under the greatest of stress and most fierce of peril, I have seen him draw a rifle round onto a target, as might a draftsman scribe a line with the straightest rule. What say you? Might we swoop down upon our prey from a great kite? Archie. The 25th of March, 1892. Chetworth House. Cornwall. Archie. Your prodigious imagination will most certainly make demands upon my skills in the hunt. I thank you for your praise, and feared that my own opinion of my performance would immediately respond in the positive. 
Alternatively, to assess if our observation platform could deliver our illuminated mechanism has required some considerable research and experimentation to determine the practical utility of this proposal. To gain some objective perspective, I turn to my dear sister Harriet. My sister has temporarily returned to Chetworth House to rest from her many travels overseas with her nursing mission. These journeys do on occasion demand from her some skill in defensive shooting, and her skills are bettered by very few gentlemen she may encounter on her journeys, much to each gentleman's great cost. I tracked my sister to our stables to gather some skilled and objective opinion on my prowess with firearms and whether I could achieve the shot that you describe in your illustration. Unfortunately, my sister and I have long suffered a certain competition between our respective shooting skills, a rivalry that has endured since our father first placed a rifle in my hands and my dear sister objected to this blatant favoritism. Despite our father's disappearance from this education only two years later, together, my sister and I have developed a practiced eye throughout our childhood to serve us both very well into maturity. As one might anticipate, rather than offer a brief opinion, Harriet asked me to include in this correspondence her gratitude to you for presenting an opportunity to once more compare our efforts and test my claim to superiority. To answer your question in all honesty, Harriet suggested some arduous experimentation upon the grounds of Chetworth House. At your suggestion, and in an attempt to replicate the illustration that you kindly provided, Harriet directed the gentlemen of the house manufactory to erect a swinging platform from one of the highest trees on the grounds. The tree selected by Harriet was, in fact, the very tree from which she fell so many years before, to her now permanent impairment. I suspect her choice may have been to prick my guilt over her injury and spoil my aim. Regardless, the gentlemen of the manufactory quickly slung from this cursed tree a platform to your specifications and a mechanism to swing it most violently. Upon this unsteady platform, both Harriet and I spent a very pleasant afternoon discharging various firearms from my collection in an attempt to hit the smallest of targets at a variety of distances. Our long-standing competitive fervor in this matter only escalated the challenge to a most ludicrous condition, and soon we were striking targets far smaller than a mere whale, under motions far more vigorous than I would expect our observation platform may experience at sea. The gentlemen of the manufactory swung the platform upon which we perched with great gusto, whilst targets were moved to and fro with great vigour. It is often the case that Harriet will escalate a wager far beyond that to which any sensible gentleman is willing to risk, and in this situation behaved little different. Ultimately, I was forced to abandon my part in this competition once my sister had used her feminine wiles to convince young Jarvis that gentleman of the manufactory most recently engaged to sprint about the gardens as Harriet attempted to drive our most enormous caliber from the collection through a silver tea tray held aloft above the young man's head. I can report success as the tray was struck true, and the young man suffered no ill effect whatsoever from the experience, save the stiff drink with which he was rewarded upon the conclusion of our afternoon's experimentation. Uriah. The 14th of April, 1892. Archibald Jenkins, Bristol. Uriah. We have proposed a means to track the Minka to observe the creature's highways and habits in the open seas. We have yet to consider how we resolve the wager that provoked your too worthy but drink weary guests to fund our adventures. We must follow our quarry to the edge of the southern ice and then follow these wanderers as they dive beneath this floating shelf. I fear that once we reach the border between the open sea and the ice, to plunge our observation platform beneath the frozen waters, as might a diving bell, may be detrimental to the occupants. Slung aloft into the winds of the southern pole will most definitely be somewhat arduous. Plunged beneath the ice will freeze us solid. We must therefore find some means to follow the Minka beneath the ice, whilst we remain above. I set my mind to this task, and it took me some considerable time to arrive at some strategy that would suffice. 
It is clear that little will pass through the ice above the whale without passage eased by the drilling of a hole. Not even would our illumination be seen beneath the ice unless this frozen cover has become extremely thin. This left me with few options to communicate from beneath the ice, and as a result, a solution is forced upon me that must employ magnetism to achieve our ends. A magnetic field will pass through the ice shelf, and should the distance be sufficiently small, and the field be sufficiently large, may be detected on the other side of the obstruction. If such a magnetic influence could be delivered from our whale, the detection device I propose consists of an induction coil, the core of which is an open magnetic circuit, the terminals of the coil being connected with a source of alternating or interrupted current and suitable indicating devices. A source of interrupted or alternating current constantly flows through the induction coil. A suitable current measuring instrument is adapted to give a warning whenever a variation in the current occurs. Such a device situated in the course of iron or steel that passes near to the open magnetic circuit of the coil will increase the self-induction of the coil and less current will flow through the circuit. The indicating device will denote such decrease in current and indicate the presence of a metallic mass. Unfortunately, our prey is not composed of a large metallic mass. As a result, this proposal would better detect the iron mass of a passing ship, but not the soft flesh of a marine mammal. So we must transform our prey to adopt an iron appearance to our detection device. I sketched for a time possible saddles, harnesses and devices that might apply iron materials to the surface of a whale. I even took the liberty to copy the mechanism that you proposed that may fix a device to the whale's skin using a vacuum and operated by the passing flow of seawater. A meal with my parents at my family home once more provided me an opportunity to inquire with my parents. For the carriage works is well experienced in the attachment of harness to horse. My mother, as ever, showed interest in her son's efforts. And as ever, a wry smile creased her face once she had examined my papers and illustrations. Obviously to saddle a great beast with a vast hull of iron or numerous metallic pots is a foolish proposal. The great mass of iron required to stimulate our sensitive but experimental detector of iron is unlikely to offer the intense influence upon our device required to detect our prey beneath meters of ice. Should saddling a whale with a mass necessary to provoke our detector, my mother added, the poor beast would most assuredly sink to the bottom of the ocean. With the whale thus sunk, one of our fellows from the Institute of Cetaceous Research will most definitely be well proved in his position, she added, on the very edge of mirth. With her even manner once more collected, my mother offered a more measured observation. We have already attached to our whale a mechanism that might be provoked into the generation of a strong electromagnetic field. Archie. The 22nd of May, 1892. Chetworth House. Archie, how easy it is to focus so very hard upon a known quality that the inertia of such knowledge can fix us upon a solution with such power that alternatives will be ignored. When we find ourselves too close to a problem, the most obvious solution will become those blinkers we would harness upon a horse to obscure distractions from both left and from right. From my vantage, reading your correspondence and dislocated from the problem, as was your remarkable mother, the solution to which you refer was apparent before I had finished reading. Your dynamo towed by our great beasts will generate a prodigious current should the creatures swim at a great speed. Whales are powerful creatures, and to tap some small part of that vitality could supply energy to a powerful electromagnet. If your magnetic detection device is found to be sufficiently sensitive, and assuming that the minka feed at the margins of the shelf where the ice is thinnest, then the wager could be resolved as each whale could be detected and followed as they vanish beneath the ice shelf. I was musing thus when I realized that I too may suffer from an inertia of my own. After all, those worthy gentlemen of the Royal Society have wagered that the Minka whale may dive beneath the ice shelf for sustenance or may dart just below the surface in search of food. Hence could the beast itself tell us of its journey simply through correlation of depth below the ice and the time thus submerged. This would require only the inclusion into our beacon of a simple clock and a hydrostatic pressure measurement as might be found upon a diving bell. Together and recorded onto paper, the journey below could be replayed. I contacted our sponsors for clarification of the evidence they demand, but alas, 
After much debate during yet another prodigious bout of alcoholic indulgence at my club, both parties will be satisfied with naught but a measurement of position and time to derive speed in association with a measured depth. These gents enthusiastically encourage me to include a means to record the depths to which the creatures dive. However, assured me that simply because a whale may plumb the depths does not mean it does not seek the shallows for a meal. I fear that in my inquiry I have only increased the complexity of the device and the difficulty of the task, not simplified it as I desired. Hence, I returned to your magnetic detector to determine the motion of whales below the ice to demonstrate that these creatures dart with speed just below the frozen shelf to feed. If we can detect no magnetic signature at all, then these creatures must surely lunge to the depths to find their meal to be recorded by our pressure measurement. In this, a problem remains. The magnetic influence with which you propose to penetrate the ice shelf is extremely localized, and our whale might be found anywhere under this vast frozen plate. As we do not know where the whale might make southern landfall, our detector must cover as large an area as possible, but must also become concentrated upon a specific point. How do we place your device for the detection of magnetic fields directly above the suspected location of our prey? How do we cover the vast expanse of ice in search of these signals? How might we use this detector to determine the speed of each beast? We might resolve this problem by scattering your detector as sentinel across the entire expanse of the ice shelf. A costly and impractical strategy indeed. Hence, as we have no practical means to follow the mink below, once the chase is afoot, follow it above we must. The ice shelf is barrier to our ship. Once found, how do we keep pace with these agile beasts and pursue them across the ice once we must disembark from our vessel? Uriah the 4th of June, 1892. Archibald Jenkins, Bristol. Uriah. The conundrum that you pose in your previous correspondence does not particularly vex, as the scale at which we need to travel far over the sea, and our need to travel at speed over the ice, differ quite markedly. A seagoing vessel must be large and cavernous to accommodate many crew, and sustain them with supplies for many months. A vehicle that might travel for some short time over the ice in pursuit of prey, may only demand a pair of crewmates that require little sustenance during their brief but swift foray. The two vehicles are of such different size that it seems unlikely that the operation of one will interfere significantly with the other. The ice-bound vehicle is likely too small to consume much storage space upon our ship, and the large scale of the seagoing marine vessel is unlikely to impede the provision of necessary functions upon the ice-bound vehicle. The problem arises in the transition from one to the other. Once the beasts are pursued to the ice shelf, upon their dive beneath, we will have no means to track their course, for the illumination they tow will be obscured by the great mass of ice. Hence, we must transition from sea to land immediately, to avoid losing the faint signal produced by the electromagnetic fields we propose, to be received by the sensitive detector we must employ. This transition is by no means smooth, for the transformation from sea to ice may not be clear. As we approach the frozen shelf, sea may give way to ice gradually to demand that our vessel navigate frozen obstructions of increasing size. Our detector must be mounted upon a vehicle that can navigate this intermediate interface, replete with open stretches of water, punctuated by sheets of treacherous ice. This vessel must offer both boat and carriage, able to traverse each medium with ease. A boat-shaped hull is essential, should we find ourselves in open water. Allied with the skis of a sleigh, perhaps a vessel could traverse both. Should sufficient velocity be achieved, those skis designed to traverse snow and ice might offer sufficient lift to skip across the water's surface. If this arrangement offers a suitable chassis to continue the chase from sea to land and through the intermediate condition, then some thought is required on how motive power must be delivered to this device. We might imagine some heat engine powered by steam, raised from the combustion of petroleum or coal. We may also imagine motion raised from electric forces. In this, we must also consider the weakness of the magnetic signal that we seek and the sensitivity of our detector. We can be thankful that other ferrous influences are absent in the vast and empty expanse of snow through which we will make chase. However, as ever, with one solution proposed, a new harm is introduced. The reciprocating iron parts of a heat engine 
or the electric components of a battery-operated vehicle will introduce complex and moving fields of magnetic influence into our local environment. Much as the compass of a marine vessel may be influenced by the iron hull of the vessel, it commands our detector may be overwhelmed by the vehicle in which it is carried, with little opportunity to account for this influence, as a ship's compass might be corrected by Kelvin's iron balls upon the binnacle. Hence our vehicle has no means of propulsion, for all means available will disrupt the very signal that we seek. We must find a vehicle and means of propulsion to which our detector is inert. A vehicle of wooden construction entire is demanded, with no metallic parts, not any iron trinkets carried onto the craft by the crew. Our sleigh may be pulled by horse or dog, but these beasts will find no traction as we pass over water. Hence, the only option that remains is to propel our auxiliary vessel, just as its parent, with the wind. I propose a lightweight vehicle as illustrated in the enclosed papers, pulled to prodigious speeds by a spinnaker. Armed with such a vehicle, and able to measure both the location of our prey and its speed through the turn of additional wheels, the presence and behavior of the minky whale beneath the ice is observed. Archie. The 17th of June, 1892. Chetworth House, Cornwall. Archie. It does indeed seem that once the ice shelf is reached, we must transfer our pursuit from a seagoing vessel to some novel means to traverse the frozen wastes. Once arrived, if we consider the speed at which the minku may vanish beneath the ice, I fear that settling our vessel against this barrier and the deployment of our vehicle via a ramp or pulley, as we might launch a boat, may provoke a delay in which our prey will become lost. I propose that the moment the forward motion of our parent vessel is impeded by fragments of ice, we should immediately launch our secondary craft to continue the pursuit. This will not only create a greater demand upon a hybrid nature for this small vessel, but may demand that we once more provoke the wind to haul ourselves from the deck of our vessel as we propose to save our souls in your lifeboat design of 1884. The vessel you illustrate adopts this hybrid nature to present a boat hull and skis and indeed wheels to traverse sea, ice and land respectively. However, my great experience in naval design is disconcerted by your device, for these three means to support our vehicle upon this variety of material all compete for their place. The boat hull dominates the device to support the vessel whilst at sea, and yet those skis will drag beneath this hull in preparation for an ice-bound venture, as will those wheels that await a yet firmer footing. The function that each adopts may be similar to support the craft, and yet they each occlude the others as they compete to fulfill their role. Might elegance result not from a similarity in role, but the delivery of each function with a similarity of structure. I propose in the enclosed papers a modification of your device, in which waterborne and iceborne motion are offered by structures of a similar form. Upon the water, the volume of three pontoons offer support through buoyancy, and yet upon the ice, the slender apex of these buoyant hulls offer the function of a ski. Hence, two devices that offer two functions become a single object. Furthermore, I fear that once the ice shelf itself is reached, you may have ill-considered the transition from sea to solid ground. This ice shelf, floating as it does upon the water, may be raised by some feet from the surface of the sea. Hence, propelled by our kite, our craft must be sufficiently lightweight to permit a short leap to be made from one to the other, as Lilienthal did only one year ago from his artificial mounds. Finally, the journey through an intermediate landscape of open water and floating ice platforms will provoke such jarring impacts that some mechanism to protect the crew from this severe agitation is demanded. All of these considerations drive our needs away from the sturdy security of beloved boat hulls that have transported me across the globe to a lightweight, insubstantial and highly flexible chassis. Subsequent to my springtime correspondence, Dear Harriet's competitive fervour abated for but a few weeks. I fear her occasional visits to Chetworth do bore her so compared to the excitement to be found in her nursing duties. The opportunity to demonstrate her supremacy with firearms became exhausted, for Harriet ultimately expended all of the ammunition in the house in her efforts. 
quiet descended upon the grounds, and we were all ultimately blessed with salvation from her daily reports. A month's peace was eventually broken, as Harriet resorted to bow and arrow, retrieved from our dear mother's belongings, to continue our competition. Such a challenge I could not refuse, and so a great competition with these primitive devices commenced. This ongoing contest was well-timed, for the flexible action of bow against string did offer the most excellent example of how a strong but lightweight structure might smooth our passage over water, snow and ice. Uriah The 2nd of July, 1892. Archibald Jenkins. Bristol. Uriah I fear that Miss Chetworth will continue her sport until she returns to a field tent filled with bandages, bedpans, and those in need of her tender care. In the eight years of our friendship and my acquaintance with Miss Chetworth, I have not known her to remain at Chetworth House much longer than a month or so. I predict that her boredom will grow to a prodigious pressure, and once more, her restless soul will take flight to foreign parts. In fact, in recent correspondence, Harriet did make some mention of a need for her particular talents in Southern Africa so no doubt her duties will soon draw her from your company and keep her well occupied. Regarding our high-speed, wind-powered vessel, once Willow has met Leather, we cannot always predict if our shot will make it to the boundary until we expose our ideas to the rigours of debate. It seems that I have struck a nothing shot and not a single run with my proposal. Now that I have my eye in, and you offer me good length, let's take another swing at this design. To offer disparate functions with similar structures is a fine proposal. Too often we may be led to believe that elegance is discovered from similar functions, and yet it is the similarity in solution regardless of function that will present a pleasing outcome. Find enclosed my interpretation of your illustration. A lightweight and flexible chassis is bound together with non-ferrous fixings, such as brass, and supported by pontoons, with not only the volume to float, but also feel little friction upon the ice. As we thunder over the ice, pulled by our kite, that bow-like frame will flex to accommodate sudden changes in surface texture that may, unmoderated at such speeds, rattle the teeth from our very heads. I discard the wheeled support, of which we will have little use in the frozen wastes. However, I leave a single wheel to freely trail behind as a tyre or water wheel, the rotation of which in either medium will provide is some measure of speed. As a consequence of trimming of our structure so, a lightweight vessel results and the ejection of this device from our deck at great speed is assured to continue the pursuit over sea, ice, and a mixture of the two. The operator of the detection equipment will direct the captain of our ship, as a river pilot will direct a vessel through well-learned waters. I previously placed this pilot behind the captain, to not obscure the view of one who must steer the ship with precision. However, as the wind may roar past our ears, and with the rumble of the ice surface rattling through our bones, with the ship's pilot seated forward of the captain, he can better direct the captain for his hand signals will be better observed. With these two pontoons spread left and right before the vessel, it occurs that an improvement in our detection method could be realized. With a single detector mounted upon our vessel, we must determine the trajectory of the target via the detection of consecutive successive changes. We would measure the strength of signal received from our prey, then make some progress and determine how this signal changes to then make some decision on whether we are moving towards or away from our target. I would expect that such a method to determine the direction to pursue our prey might result in a careen left to right as we monitor this change in signal. Alternatively, if we make use of those pontoons to permit two iron detection devices to be carried, we might make two simultaneous detections. The difference between these signals could offer some indication of the direction in which our prey flees, much as our two ears detect not only sound, but also the direction of such noise. I intend to arrive at Chetworth House this following month in preparation for our journey southwards. Do please pass Harriet my regards, should she depart before I make my arrival. Archie This chapter in Chetworth's adventures was provoked by the puzzle of detecting something from a distance before radio transmission, which became a reality only a few years after the events described. Archibald Jenkins didn't invent the metal detector. The device described in this chapter was patented in the same year that Marconi patented his radio, in 1896, by Francis B. Bart of Chicago under US 571 
739. As these were patented simultaneously, I could just have easily drawn Marconi's invention into existence a few years earlier as I have Bart's. However, as Bart's invention is specifically designed to operate submerged in seawater, I felt Jenkins' choice of metal detector a more plausible device to operate in the depths of the Antarctic Ocean. Bard names his device an electromagnetic sentinel and describes it as follows. My invention relates to an electromagnetic sentinel for detecting the approach of a mass of magnetic material, and more particularly armor-clad warships. The special object of my invention is to provide a device readily stationed in commanding positions that will automatically give warning of the presence of battleships in that vicinity and thereby enable a submerged mine or torpedo to be exploded by a switch operated either by hand or automatic means. At the moment, the hostile vessel is above such explosive. The particular value offered by Bart's Sentinel is its automatic nature. Contemporary means to achieve the same end channel the opposition over the explosive whilst two observers determine the position of the target and operate the charge. The best method heretofore employed for coast protection by means of explosive mines has been to sink them in the waterway desired to be protected, but preferably in a narrow channel, and from two observatories upon shore connected by telephone and telegraph by means of range finders the officers on duty follow the movements of any hostile vessel. When the instruments indicate the said vessel is directly above the hidden mine by means of a switch operated either automatically or by hand, controlling a source of powerful electric current, the mine is exploded. This method, however, is subject to the objection of the high cost of such protection, as two observatories and sets of instruments and two or more operators of such instruments are necessitated. The apparatus above described is also somewhat unreliable, as it is quite easily disordered and thereby liable to be rendered inoperative and can be used to follow the movements of but one vessel at a time at night or during the prevalence of fog, storms, or any other condition tending to obstruct the vision, its usefulness is greatly limited or altogether impaired. Bard's device required no such observers, potentially operating entirely automatically. Bard suggests that such a device could be used to detonate the warhead of a sea mine lying in wait, or of a self-propelled torpedo. On the contrary, the device of my present application is automatic in its action and gives its warnings by night as well as by day. It is simple and direct in its operation and requires but a single observatory, set of instruments and attendant, or it may be so constructed as to automatically explode the mine. A slight modification of the device is easily applicable to the self-propelled type of torpedo, being so constructed as to explode the same when within effective distance of any hostile ironclad and thereby doing away with the necessity of actual contact of the torpedo with the vessel's hull, which would serve to render the torpedo more effective. As I have few specialist skills in electrical circuits, I rely upon Bart's own description of the operation of his metal detection device, lifting his words in their entirety for Jenkins' correspondence. A schematic of the device is offered. If those more skilled in electrical engineering see errors in the practical effectiveness of this device, I refer you to Bart himself to make inquiries. I would be surprised if the electromagnetic field generated by a device towed by a minky whale could indeed be detected by a 19th century metal detector. However, innovative concepts should not be treated as solutions to problems, but should be collated as questions for the laboratory to answer. Hence, I leave it to the experts to make the necessary calculations to determine what further invention Jenkins must offer for this concept to function as described.